So tonight we're going to continue chapter 1 of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. Chapter 1 is of the Holy Scriptures. And as we um, look at this, we saw last week in the first six paragraphs of chapter 1, the inspiration, the inerrancy, and the sufficiency of Scripture. That Scripture is the Word of God, inspired by God, that when you hear Scripture, you are hearing God speak. When you are reading Scripture, God is speaking to you through His Word. As we said, God speaks today through Scripture alone. And so the sufficiency of Scripture is the Bible is complete. There is nothing to be added to or taken away from it. And there is nothing that is lacking in Scripture that we need. It is not as if there is some spiritual truth that we need that is not contained in the Bible. God has given us all that we need in Scripture. Also, Scripture is infallible, which is different from inerrancy. Inerrancy means that Scripture is without error. It's totally true. Infallible means that Scripture will accomplish its purpose. So infallible means that Scripture is powerful, it is living, it is active, it changes lives. The Word of God saves people from their sin because in it they find the gospel of Jesus Christ through which they are, by which they are saved. So we looked at those in the first six paragraphs and tonight we will finish chapter one by starting in paragraph seven. So this is on page 13, middle of the page, chapter one, Paragraph 7, and I've entitled tonight's study, The Perspicuity of Scripture. Now, I know that's a big, fancy theological term. Let me tell you what perspicuity means. <clears throat> a lot of people will tell you that perspicuity simply means that Scripture is clear. It means that, but that's not all that it means. Perspicuity means not only is Scripture clear in its meaning... But God has given us everything we need to be able to understand it. So the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture also recognizes that the Holy Spirit helps us understand His Word. That those who are born again by grace through faith in Jesus Christ are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And when we read His sufficient, inspired Word, He enables us as Christians to understand His Word. Now, God has given you pastors and theologians who can help you to understand His Word. But it is also true that if you read your Bible, you are able to understand what it says. You might struggle in certain areas. There might be things that will take a lot of study. And you may have to ask your pastor or read a book to try to research something or study something to better figure it out. But the point is this. The Bible is not some cryptic code book. I hear so many people saying things like, well, I can't understand the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation or, God forbid, the book of Leviticus, my favorite book, right? So we, we know that, that some things in Scripture are harder to understand, but that does not mean that you can't understand them. And one of the things, the principles that we see coming out of the Protestant Reformation that early Baptists emphasized is the principle of Scripture interpret Scripture. The best way to understand what Scripture means here is to read the rest of Scripture. There are so many places where later Scripture clarifies what comes before. In the New Testament, we have an inspired commentary on many of the Old Testament passages. When Paul speaks about Abraham... In Romans chapter 4, and how Abraham was justified by faith and not by works. Uh, so many times when the New Testament authors cite Old Testament authors and, and explain what those passages mean. Uh, as we read the whole of the Bible, we can understand the Bible better. So if you're reading one passage and don't understand it, uh, part of the key to understanding that passage is to continue to read all of the Bible. This is why you need to read from Genesis to Revelation. You need to read through your Bible. And as you do that, you will understand much better what it is saying. And when you apply yourself to the study of God's Word as a born-again believer in Christ and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, you really can understand your Bible. It's not impossible. You shouldn't feel that the Bible is this book that you 
can never understand. That is not the case. And when we talk about the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture, what we're saying is, is this book is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so that you can understand what the Lord God has spoken to you. I'm citing there Deuteronomy chapter 30, where Moses told the people that when he gave them the Scriptures. You can understand it. It is the Word of God. And God gave it to you to read, to study, and to grow in your faith in Christ. So chapter 1, paragraph 7 of the 1689 Baptist Confession states, Some things in Scripture are clearer than others. And some people understand the teachings more clearly than others. However, the things that must be known, believed, and obeyed for salvation are so clearly set forth and explained in one part of Scripture or another that both the educated and the uneducated may achieve a sufficient understanding of them by properly using ordinary measures. Now what they've really done in that paragraph is state very succinctly and very beautifully what I have been explaining. Yes, there are some things in Scripture that are, that are easier to understand than others. It, it is true, the book of Revelation is difficult. It's not impossible, but it is difficult and challenging. A book like 1 John is just very straightforward, easy to follow, easy to understand. There are some books of the Bible that are just easier than others to study and to understand what is being said. But that does not mean that there is any book of the Bible that you cannot understand. And some people understand the teachings more clearly than others. Yes, it is true. Some people are simply more gifted um, at reading and understanding literature. Uh, some of us are that kind of person. I'm a very left brain person. I'm a very type A personality. I think uh, through things. I'm very logical. Uh, when I took my ACT, I made a 19 in math and a 36 in English. If that tells you anything about me, okay? I'm really good at reading texts and understanding them. I'm not the best at algebra, okay? That's just me. That's how God wired me. And praise God, I didn't become an engineer. I became a preacher because I originally was going to try to be an engineer. I think I would have struggled uh, if I had pursued that any further. So we can see that, that some people, yes, are more naturally gifted. But that doesn't mean that, listen, any of us who just has a basic ability to read the Bible can understand it. Even a child, if that child is able to read, and even before they're able to read, able to hear and understand words, it, once they begin to speak, they can understand the simple truths of scripture you do not have to be a bible scholar we need bible scholars but you don't have to feel inadequate because you're not a bible scholar you have the word of god you have the holy spirit of god you are able to understand his word they say however the things that must be known believed and obeyed for salvation are so clearly set forth and explained in one part of scripture or another that both the educated and the uneducated may achieve a sufficient understanding of them by properly using ordinary means. The, the, the central doctrines of Scripture are plain. The scripture is very clear. There is only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is very clear. You cannot earn your way to heaven. You can only be saved by trusting in what Jesus has done for you. The, the reality is, is that the, the, the most central doctrines of the Christian faith are plain on the pages of Scripture. God is not hiding salvation from us. It's right there on the pages of the Bible. And so notice they say that even the, whether educated or uneducated, we are all able to achieve a sufficient understanding. It doesn't say a total understanding. I don't have a total understanding of the Bible, okay? There are still things in the Bible that I'm trying to figure out, all right? And, and, and that will be true for the rest of my life. Because it's God's Word. It's a big book. It's a complex book. But that doesn't mean that the basic message isn't, isn't clear enough so that when my children read their Bible, they understand it. So whether educated or uneducated, 
we are all able to achieve a sufficient understanding of these truths in Scripture by properly using ordinary means. And by the way, I hear people sometimes say things like, well, I just got a feeling or I just knew. I, I, a lot of times I'll hear people, they'll talk about a, a certain preacher and they say, well, I just got a, a funny feeling about him. I'm not sure if he's a true preacher of the Word of God or, or I got a good feeling about him. I think he is a true preacher. Listen, don't trust your feelings. Just compare what you're being taught to the Word of God. Feelings can lead you astray. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is desperately sick and deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Your heart will lead you astray. Your feelings, your gut can be wrong, but the Word of God is not wrong. And if you just take what's being taught and compare it to the Word of God, you can figure out whether it's true or false preaching. It really is fairly simple. In fact, they cite here in paragraph 7, Psalm chapter 19. And I'm not going to preach through Psalm 19 tonight, but in Psalm 19 verse 7, where they cite this in the confession, it says that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The simple there, and it doesn't mean like, it doesn't mean simple the way it sometimes is used in the English language, like of a person who's not educated. The, the Hebrew word translated simple there means someone who comes in simple faith. They just, they just come to Scripture and believe it's God's Word, right? So the idea is making wise those who have simple faith. The word simple in Hebrew there is the opposite of the word proud. So the proud person thinks he knows everything. The simple person knows he needs to learn from God. And he comes to the scriptures in simple faith, wanting to learn the truth. And if you approach the Bible with that kind of simple, humble faith, it will make you wise, Psalm 19 verse 7 says. Continuing in paragraph 8. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the native language of the ancient people of God. The New Testament was written in Greek, which at the time it was written was most widely known to the nations. Now, I do, I do want to add something here. There are parts of the Old Testament, um, Daniel, parts of Daniel, uh, Ezra, and Esther that were written in Aramaic. Aramaic is a similar language to Hebrew, but it is not the same. Um, and so those who can read Hebrew can kind of work their way through Aramaic, but it is not the same language. But 98% of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and, and, and small portions of a few books were written in Aramaic. The, the entirety of the New Testament was written in Greek. And they note that it was, at the time, the most widely known to the nations. That's because Alexander the Great had conquered the ancient world under the Greek Empire, and Greek was kind of like English is today. It was the standard language of the ancient world. Uh, wherever you go in the world today, um, there are many English speakers in many nations across the world. Now, that doesn't mean that every nation has English speakers, but it is true that English is the most widely spoken language in the world. Greek was like that in the first century. It was the most widely spoken, widely used language, and that is the language that the New Testament was written in. They go on to say these testaments, and by the way, testament is the Latin word for, okay, I said this in the ladies' Sunday school class. Ladies, do you remember? Testament is the Latin word for what word? Come on. Y'all weren't paying attention? Covenant. Testament is the Latin word for covenant. So when we say old covenant, new covenant, Old Testament and New Testament mean Old Covenant and New Covenant. Old Covenant referring to the Mosaic Covenant, New Covenant referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, uh, paying for our sin. So uh, Testament, Covenant, same word, Testament, Testamentum is the Latin word. Uh, covenant uh, comes from a Hebrew word, uh, and they, 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 they're referring to the, the law, the law of Moses, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in Christ's blood. So these testaments, Old and New Covenant, Old and New Testament, they were inspired directly by God 
And by his unique care and providence, they were kept pure down through the ages. Now, I'm going to say something here. This is important. Notice what they're saying and notice what they're not saying. They just told you that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Parts were written in Aramaic, but for the most part it was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. And these testaments, the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, they were inspired directly by God and by His unique care and providence, they, the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, were kept pure down through the ages. Now, there will be some who will probably not fully appreciate what I'm about to say. Maybe not here, but there are certainly some that we would love and consider brothers and sisters in Christ who may have a conviction that there is maybe only one translation of the Bible you should use or that that translation is itself inspired. That's not what the early Baptists believe. The position today that is known as King James Onlyism was not what the early Baptists believe. They said here that the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament were kept pure down through the ages. Now, is the King James Version and many other translations of the Bible, are they accurate translations so that we can take them and say this is the Word of God? Yes. But I do not believe that God inspired a translation of the Bible. I don't think there is a perfect translation. Rather, we have accurate translations of the inspired Word of God, the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, so that it is the Word of God translated into our language. But the point is this. The early Baptists did not believe that any translation was final or necessarily superior to another. Uh, the reality is, is that that is a new idea uh, that really became popularized in the 20th century. And that is not what the first 300 or so years of Baptists believed. That is just a historical fact. And this confession of faith says it. So... Is your Bible the Word of God? Yes, it is. Can you trust it and believe it? Yes, you can. But you need to understand that it's a translation that Paul didn't write in English. He wrote in Greek. Moses did not write in English. He wrote in Hebrew. Now, there are scholars who translated the Bible for us, and they accurately translated it. Now, there are some bad translations, by the way. Do not use the message, okay? Okay. Uh, it's not a good translation. There are some translations that are mostly good, but there are still some serious deficiencies in them. Um, I'm not going to go through naming all the translations. If you're interested in that, let me know. There's too many to name. Um, but yes, the King James translation is a good translation. The New King James, the ESV, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Legacy Standard Bible, the New American Standard Bible. Those are not the only ones, but those are some examples of very good translations of the Bible. What I want you to understand is, and, and I want to say this because those who hold to a King James only position, they are holding to a position that the men who translated the King James Bible themselves did not hold to. And if you don't believe me, go home and Google the preface to the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Read the preface to the King James version of the Bible. And you will read, they first write to the king and then they write to the reader. And you will read the, the translation committee, those who produce the 1611 King James Version. They say that this is an imperfect translation, that others will have to come along after us and improve it, that the work of translation is never finished. Those who translated the King James Version themselves did not believe that their translation was perfect, and they said in the preface to the translation that it would have to be improved upon later. They refuted the very position of King James onlyism, the very people who gave us that translation. Furthermore, the King James Version that is used today is not the 1611 King James Version. Almost no one uses it because it's very difficult for a modern English reader. 
Most people are using what is called the 1769 Blaney Revision of the King James Version. If you go buy a KJV Bible in a bookstore, you almost certainly are getting a 1769 Blaney Revision, or you might, in some circumstances, get the 1769 Oxford Revision, both in the year 1769, updating the language of the King James Version, and that was one of many updates. So, what you should understand is that really there have been many updates to the King James Version of the Bible, uh, and the one that's used today is actually an updated version of the first version, which was produced in 1611. The early Baptists said that the Hebrew and Greek text was inspired and kept pure down through the ages. And it's not just the early Baptists, that's what Protestant Christians believed. It was interesting, those who did believe in inspired translation were the Catholics. They believed that the Latin Vulgate was an inspired translation. They held to a supreme translation, the Latin Vulgate, and the Protestants were arguing against that idea. And by the way, when they wrote this, the early Baptists, none of the early Protestants believed in a perfect translation. So what were they arguing against here? They were arguing against a Catholic idea that the Latin translation of the Bible was inspired. That's what they were denying. And so, continuing on, they said they are, that is the Old and New Testaments, they are therefore true and authoritative so that in all religious controversies, the church must make their ultimate appeal to them. When you have a question of doctrine, make your appeal to the Bible. Go to the Bible and find what it says. It doesn't matter what grandma or grandpa believed or what the preacher you grew up under believed. I'm not saying they might not have been right. and I'm sure they were godly people. But the way you prove what is true is by showing it in Scripture. You have to settle these matters by going to the Bible and finding out what says the Lord on this matter. All God's people have a right to and a claim on the Scriptures, and they, are not command, and they are commanded in the fear of God to read and to search them. Not all of God's people know these original languages, so the Scriptures are to be translated into the common language of every nation to which they come. And there you go, right there. They said, look, we've been talking about the Hebrew and Greek Bible that has been kept pure down through the ages. And someone says, well, you don't have the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. I don't have Paul's copy of the letter that he wrote to Philippi, but what I have today contains what Paul wrote in that letter. I have a copy of his letter. We have over 6,000 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. No, we don't have the original letter to the Roman church, but we do have everything that was in the letter to the Roman church in copies in Greek manuscript copies of Paul's letter. So no, we do not have the original document because documents don't tend to survive for 2,000 years in the desert. However, we do have every word of Scripture that was originally written, but we have copies of the original documents because they were written so long ago. So it must be translated in the language to which they come. Whatever language that is, we should put the Bible into the common language of the people to whom we bring the gospel. In this way, the word of God may dwell richly in all so that they may worship him in an acceptable manner and through patience and the comfort of the scriptures may have hope. Continuing on to paragraph 9. The infallible rule for interpreting scripture is the scripture itself. This is the Reformation principle. This isn't just what Baptists believed. This is what all Protestants believed. The infallible rule of interpreting Scripture is Scripture. We don't appeal to a pope. We don't appeal to preachers in the past. We can learn from them, uh, preachers in the past, right? We can read Bible commentaries and we can ask theologians. You can ask me. But it's not that way because I said so or some... Bible commentary says so. Ultimately, the Word of God is the rule by which we interpret the Word of God because there are 66 books and it is a consistent whole. It is a cohesive whole. It all fits together. It does not contradict itself. 
And also there are so many places where the later authors tell you what passages in former authors, what those passages mean. So, Scripture interprets Scripture. That is the principle. Therefore, when there is a question about the true and full meaning of any part of Scripture, and each passage has only one meaning, not many, (laughs) notice that. You ever heard somebody say, well, what does this verse mean to you? I don't want what it means to you. I want what it means. They're, they're, They're repudiating that idea in the confession here. Each passage has only one meaning, not many. It doesn't have a meaning to you, it just has a meaning. Whatever the author intended, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that's what it means. It must be understood in light of other passages that speak more clearly. Lastly, paragraph 10. The supreme judge for deciding all religious controversies and for evaluating all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, human teachings, and individual interpretations in whose judgment we are to rest, is nothing but the Scripture delivered by the Spirit. In this Scripture, our faith finds its final word. There can be value in Bible commentaries. There can be value in the history of Christianity and what has been taught and preached throughout generations. There is value in this confession of faith. But this confession of faith is not inerrant and it's not infallible and it's not sufficient. I like this confession of faith, but this is the Word of God, right? And we have to understand the difference. We can go to other books and sources to get very helpful instruction and we can learn, but our ultimate appeal must be to the Scriptures themselves. Now lastly tonight, I want to take you to a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to encourage you with the main point I want to drive home tonight. And that's that you can understand your Bible. And I want to encourage you to study your Bible in your own time as well as when we come to study it together as a church. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read through the, the... the chapter and just make a few comments as I go. Paul had planted the church in Corinth, pastored it for 18 months according to Acts chapter 18. And so now Paul is writing to the church that he had planted a letter checking in on them and he reminds them of how he came and first preached the gospel to them in the city of Corinth. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1, And I, when I came to you brothers... I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul came with a simple message. He didn't come as an academic. He didn't come to impress people. He just preached the Word of God. And we know from reading the book of Acts that he proved that Jesus was the Christ from the Scriptures. We are told constantly in Acts that Paul reasoned from the Scriptures. And when you look at the sermons of Peter and Paul and John, and when you look at Stephen, what are they doing? They're citing Scripture, proving these things to be so. So when he says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, he's saying, I proved who Jesus is and what He has done from the Scriptures. And they, of course, were using the Old Testament Scriptures at that point because that's all there was in the very early days of the church. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul says, look, I just came to you preaching the Bible. I gave you God's word, not man's word, so that your faith would not rest in me or what some other man said, but that you would know that you were believing what God has spoken. Or as I've said before, don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. You shouldn't believe it's true because I said it. You should only believe it's true because you saw it for yourself in the Bible. And you know that God is the ultimate source of that truth. And my job is simply to teach you what God has said. Not what I have to say, but what God has already said. Verse 6, yet among the mature, he's speaking of mature Christians, right? Among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Wisdom. 
although it's not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And this was God's word and God's plan all, all along. The gospel is old and it's never changed. Verse 8, none of the rulers of, the, of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. The lost world doesn't understand the gospel and the hope that we have in Christ. Verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Now the Spirit has revealed it in inspiring this word. And as we will notice in a moment, the Spirit illumines our hearts and our minds to understand his written word. He says, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Everything you need to know has been revealed to you by the Spirit of God. He searches everything, even the, even the depths of God. Verse 11, for who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. We have the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts as born again, blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ. And now we are able to understand the things that God has given us in His Word. The world cannot understand them, but those who belong to Christ and have the Holy Spirit on the inside, you can understand your Bible. Verse 13, And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The lost person does not accept the gospel and does not understand the gospel, and they will not until God changes their heart, opens their mind, opens their eyes. This is why the hymn says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found was blind. I was blind, but now I see. That's what's being expressed here. The lost person is not able to understand the scriptures unless God opens his eyes. These things can only be spiritually discerned, and spiritual discernment only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit helping us to understand his word. Verse 15, the spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one. Well, there's another passage that tells us that we as Christians are to judge. What does it mean to judge all things? We know what's right and what's wrong. We know what's true and what's false. And it says we are judged by no one. What, what does that mean? Don't worry when the world tells you you're wrong. The, the, the world tells you that we evolved from pond scum. Well, guess what? They're wrong. We were created in the image of God, Okay. The, the reality is, is the world does not believe the things of Scripture, but the Spirit of God bears witness in our heart and helps us to understand what His Word says and gives us confidence that these, these things are true, and we are to be judged by no one. It doesn't matter that the world rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's true. and We don't need their approval. We have the Word of God. We know the truth. Verse 16 for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? I love that. Paul says, when anyone argues with what the Bible says, what they're doing is they're saying that they're smarter than God. Paul says, who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Paul says, God has given us the truth. No man is the source of truth. God is. You don't instruct God. God instructs you. You come to the Word to learn from God, not to tell God the way it ought to be. And I think a lot of people read their Bible that way too. They come to the Bible wanting to twist it and manipulate it and make it say what they want it to say rather than say, Lord, what does your Word tell me? You ought to be willing to read the Bible with an open heart and an open mind saying, God, I will submit to whatever your word tells me. 
And if you've never read something in the Bible and realized that you were wrong and needed to repent of some sin or that you believed something which was an error, if you've never had that experience, you're not reading your Bible the right way. Because you were not born sinless and you were not born with perfect theology. And if you think you were, you don't understand how much you need Christ and His gospel and His spirit and His word. Who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? We don't tell God the way it is. He tells us the way it is in Scripture. But we have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? We are indwelt by the Spirit of God and we are taught the Word of God. We read it in the Scripture and we believe it. That Word is sufficient. We are able to understand it and having God's Word with the help of the Holy Spirit to understand His Word, we can have confidence and know that this is the truth. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word in each one here. Help us to stand upon Your Word and its truth. Thank You for the blessings You've given us in Christ. Help us, Lord, to grow in the knowledge of Your Word. I pray, Lord, that You would help us to be more committed to studying Your Word. And we trust that by Your Spirit, You will help us to understand it. Help me as the pastor of this church to faithfully and accurately teach your word and to help your people to have a deeper grasp of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.